Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present here today. Um, my doctoral thesis focused on ancient compositional practices and took an interdisciplinary approach. So within this thesis, I sought to investigate the perennial New Testament question concerning the relationship between the Gospels of John and Mark by appealing to the compositional practices of the ancient classical world. So this afternoon, I would like to share just a small part of my project with you. The work of Homer was received and remodeled by Herodotus. The work of Herodotus was received and remodeled by Thucydides. And the work of Thucydides was received and remodeled by Plutarch. Literary production in the ancient Mediterranean world was based on the reception and remodeling of predecessor texts. And both authors and readers knew that this was the modus operandi. The authors of the four canonical gospels composed their accounts of the life of Jesus's birth, ministry, death, and resurrection within this Mediterranean literary environment. However, New Testament scholars have all too often overlooked this historical premise when they ex examined the relationship between the gospels. When the four gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John are put together in a synopsis, it becomes apparent that Mark, Matthew, and Luke are similar in content, while John is notably different. Overlooking the literary environment within which the gospel authors wrote, New Testament scholars have argued that the similarities between Mark, Matthew, and Luke meant that Matthew and Luke were literarily dependent on Mark, while the differences between Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John meant that John was literarily independent of Mark, or indeed Matthew or Luke. However, by taking into consideration the literary environment within which the author composed the Gospel of John, the differences that have been used by scholars to demonstrate John's literary independence from Mark can in fact be shown to demonstrate his literary dependence on Mark. So in this paper this afternoon, I would like to spend some time looking at the theory of receiving and remodeling texts in and around the first century CE as a way of appreciating literary dependence at the time in which the author wrote the Gospel of John. Then I would like to take you into the world of the Gospels and explore John's reception and remodeling of Mark. And to think about the importance of considering the classical world for investigating the perennial New Testament question of John's relationship with Mark. So. In Mediterranean antiquity, the theory of receiving and remodeling a predecessor's written work is known as mimesis or imitatio. Longinus, in his work on the sublime, discusses imitation as he writes, the road which leads to sublimity is the zealous imitation of the great prose writers and poets of the past. This, as a theory and practice, has been thoroughly appreciated and studied within classical scholarship. But rather than focusing on secondary literature concerning imitation, I would like to look at primary evidence regarding the theory of imitation. So imitation as an approach may be described as follows. One, an author will select and borrow material from a source. Two, an author will be judicious about which source they are borrowing from. Three, an author will not directly copy the source from which they are borrowing. Four, an author will rework to an extensive degree the source they are borrowing. And five, an author will create a new and superior piece of writing. This five-stage approach is a compilation of steps laid out by various Greek and Roman literary critics and rhetoricians in their handbooks or personal correspondences. For example, Firstly, in relation to selecting and borrowing material from a source. 
Horace, in his Art of Poetry, suggests that authors should follow tradition. They should follow and borrow from traditional predecessor texts. Additionally, Seneca, in his Moral Epistles, advises that all traditional written material is common property to be borrowed. He uses a wonderful analogy of bees collecting pollen to describe this practice, as he writes, we should follow the example of bees who flit about and cull the flowers that are suitable for producing honey, and then arrange and assort in their cells all that they have brought in. Finally, Quintilian, in his On the Education of the Orator, considers this traditional common property material and encourages authors that it is from these and other authors worth reading that we must draw our stock of words the variety of our figures um, and our system of composition, and also guide our minds by the patterns they provide of all the virtues. So secondly, in regard to being judicious when choosing a source to borrow from, Quintilian remarks, everything in this field of study therefore needs to be subjected to the most careful judgment. First, whom should we imitate? Secondly, what is it in our chosen authors that we should prepare ourselves to reproduce? Then thirdly, in relation to avoiding direct copying of a source, Horace notes that authors should not render word for word as a slavish translator. Additionally, Quintilian warns that only a lazy mind is content with what others have discovered and states that, it is a disgrace to be content merely to attain the effect you are imitating. Then fourthly, in regard to thoroughly reworking a source that is borrowed, Seneca discusses the extent of reworking that should be undertaken. As he notes, I think that sometimes it is impossible for it to be seen who is being imitated if the copy is a true one for a true copy stamps its own form upon all the features which it has drawn from what we may call the original, in such a way that they are combined into a unity. And then fifthly, in regard to creating a new and superior piece of writing from the material that is borrowed, Quintilian urges authors to seek to surpass the writings of their literary predecessors within their own new works. So I would now like to turn to the Gospels of John and Mark and to demonstrate the importance for New Testament scholarship of studying these texts within their literary environment for gaining a clearer understanding of the relationship between these two Gospels. The author of the Gospel of John um, wrote his Gospel at the end of the first century CE or into the beginning of the second century. He wrote in Koine Greek, his narrative is well written, but most importantly, he would have been fully aware of the compositional practices of his time. Thus, I would like to spend the rest of the paper covering the five approaches to imitation in relation to the Gospels of John and Mark. So there are a number of comparable passages in John and Mark where John's borrowing and reworking of Mark can be explored. But for the paper this afternoon, I shall look at just the account of Jesus's baptism in the two gospels. So firstly, Mark was a written text available for use by other writers. It is evident that Matthew and Luke borrowed material from Mark for their accounts of Jesus's baptism. Thus, like his early Christian contemporaries, John also wishing to compose a gospel and to include a section on Jesus' baptism, most likely also borrowed material from Mark. Secondly, Mark seems to be an appropriate text that offers material concerning Jesus and particularly his baptism. As noted previously, Matthew and Luke deemed the gospel an appropriate source to borrow from. Thus, John too seems to have been judicious and similarly chosen Mark as a source for his own gospel and for his account of the baptism. Thirdly, 
Comparing the texts of Mark and John, it is obvious that John did not copy Mark directly. In the account of Jesus' baptism, Mark has 11 verses and John has 16. Yet of these verses, there is only one phrase where there is something that resembles verbatim agreement. In Mark, John the Baptist says, referring to Jesus, I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. And in John, John the Baptist says, I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. The Greek is on the PowerPoint here for comparison. And then fourthly, comparing Mark and John, the similarities and differences seem to suggest that John thoroughly reworks Mark. So, um, for example, looking at the baptism, Mark's text reads, um, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you're my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. While John's account reads as follows. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him, that's John the Baptist, and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of, who, of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So firstly, in Mark's account, the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist is described. While in John, there is no apparent baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And rather, the Baptist is a witness whose baptism with water is an act of witness. Whilst he is presumably baptizing others, the Baptist sees Jesus, but does not baptize him. Rather, he testifies to his status as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Secondly, in Mark's account, it is Jesus after his baptism who sees the spirit like a dove descending. Whilst in John, um, it is John the Baptist um, who sees at an earlier point in time, perhaps in a vision from God, the spirit uh, like a dove descending. Thirdly, in Mark's account, the spirit descends on Jesus. But in John, the spirit not only descends, but remains on Jesus. Fourthly, in Mark's account, it is Jesus who hears the voice of God declaring him to be his beloved son. Whereas in John, it is John the Baptist who perhaps received a vision and information from God about Jesus, who now testifies that Jesus is the son of God. So from this comparison, it seems that John borrows this material from Mark's gospel and thoroughly reworks it to create his own new account of Jesus's baptism within his own new gospel. So this leads us on to our fifth and final point concerning imitation and the Gospels. John wanted to compose his own new Gospel and to present Jesus and John the Baptist in his own way. For John, Jesus was not an individual who could be baptised as he is in Mark. Rather, according to John's prologue, he is pre-existent Logos who was not only with God from the beginning, but was God from the beginning. He comes from God the Father and returns after his death and resurrection to God the Father. But while he's in the world, he's a sacrificial lamb who can take away the sin of the entire world. Additionally, for John, John the Baptist is not a forerunner to Jesus who prepares Jesus's way through his baptisms. Um, Rather, he is a witness um, to Jesus. Other characters in the gospel, such as the disciples, are witnesses to Jesus. 
And the gospel itself is a witness to Jesus, as the author presents himself as a disciple who witnessed Jesus' ministry, death, and resurrection. For John, as he writes in his epilogue, he wishes to testify about Jesus, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. So to draw to a close, the debate concerning the relationship between the Gospels of Mark and John has been a long and at times turbulent one. Dwight Moody Smith went so far as to comment, almost every knowledgeable exegete would agree about the independence of John. However, the problem with this debate has been the lack of awareness of the literary environment within which John composed his gospel. My paper this afternoon has sought to show that John's literary dependence on Mark can be seen by placing him within this literary environment. I've demonstrated that in the same way that contemporaneous writers would have been approaching the composition of their works, John imitated Mark. He borrowed material from Mark. He was judicious about the material he borrowed. He did not copy directly, but thoroughly reworked the material and created his own new gospel. The results of this paper emphasize the need for interdisciplinary work. It highlights the importance for New Testament scholars to engage with primary sources from the classical world and also to interact with secondary scholarship on the classical world. Thank you very much.